our next speaker is the one and only Louisiana State University's. You know her from her TED Talk. You know her from her work on a star that baffles people like me and makes us, makes us stay up at night. Please welcome Dr. Tabitha Boyajan.
um, in its shape. And it didn't take folks long to realize that it kind of looks like a spaceship. This is, this is about half the size of, of a football field, right? This is like the same dimensions of a spaceship, right? Um, well, yeah, so that didn't take long, especially with this picture that kind of actually looked like a spaceship itself, that, you know, it was an actual spaceship. Um, but if you ask me, I think it also has the same uh, kind of characteristics as <laughs> the Maui Laui quarter pounder uh, that Cheech and Chong enjoyed so many years ago. Um, <coughs> And if you think about it in that way, right? I mean, this came from some other solar system. This is an interstellar interloper, right? They it's a scout, something the first time not ever discovered in our solar system, and we see it kind of flying through. And you, you kind of wonder, okay, well, I mean, if it is something from Chi Chung Chong, then, you know, maybe there were some very, uh, I, I don't know, uh, uh, maybe it's a peace offering, you could say that. Uh, <laughs> and, or maybe it is, you know, perhaps that we should um, be very worried of the aliens that are coming after that. Okay, so, um, we got, okay, aside from the ship, yeah, I said there are two different interesting things about this. The second one is the orbit of this. I said it's an interstellar interloper. And what this means is like this video shows here the sun is in the center and the planets are going around the sun. The planets all kind of move around the sun in kind of a discus shape. This, this line that comes from the top, this is a muamua. And it's using the sun basically as a slingshot. Right? As it moves by, it goes really close to the sun, it gets slingshotted out, and it's going past the Earth at 55 miles per second, out again fast into the uh, outer edges of the solar system. So this is something, not something that originated here in our solar system, right, and is never going to come back. Okay, so with this in mind, you know, we come and look at the sky, right? It looks like this, and we can actually kind of pinpoint where this thing comes from. All right, so this is this is the night sky, not as you see it in Seattle, but you know, lots of other places in the world. Uh, but so the, this kind of stripe in the middle is is the Milky Way. We have over density of stars, and we have some kind of layers of gas and dust. Um, and Oumuamua came from, if you see this kind of red blob in the center, I don't know how to work the laser, you see red blob in the center, it's kind of like a little bit up from that. We, we can trace that back with measurements of where we saw in the sky and how it was moving. Um, to give you some perspective, I've outlined some constellations labeled two stars here that you may be familiar with. So here in the center is the constellation Cygnus, uh, just up to the right of that. Uh, or to the top of that is the constellation Lyra and the star Vega, so that's star Jodie Foster went to in contact, <laughs> right? Uh, and that little, like, uh, uh, a cluster of boxes right there, that is a really special spot in the sky that we have studied for years with thanks to one of NASA's space telescopes. And this happens to be the same spot that Oumuamua seems to have come from. Isn't that cool? All right, so this is the footprint of what we say of NASA's Kepler mission. Um, if, if, if you haven't heard of this, you've probably been living under a rock, and I'm not shy about saying that and calling you out. Uh, <laughs> but but, but I, I, I will briefly explain what that is. So this is one of NASA's missions that was uh, finding planets, and it found thousands of planets in our galaxy. And it stared right at this point in the sky. Yeah. Oh, right here, yes, <laughs> technology. Alright, so this is this is the footprint right here where Kepler stared in the sky and more and more came from the same spot. Um, you may notice that there are other kind of stamps on the sky, the sky view that have been pointing out. And this is other places where Kepler is looked at, but not when it was Kepler. And this goes back to the theme of my talk, which you might have noticed was zombies. Um, and I'm really, uh, this, is, this is the only reason I think that anyone can say they're glad that the NASA people aren't here because they hate this term. 
for their telescope. So when the Kepler telescope died, uh, they uh, it, it got it got re revived in a way, um, in a very cute and special way, which is another talk in itself, as K2. Um, and so it died and it came back to life, therefore it's a zombie. Long story short, NASA does not like that. So, uh, but there you go, you have you know, this zombie telescope that, um, that looked at the star field and it found a lot of planets. So what, what did it do to do this? And what it, uh, it was staring at stars in the sky and it was monitoring their brightness and it was watching for how its brightness changed over time. And if you have a planet orbiting a star, it will go across the line of sight of you and the planet, and it will block out a tiny bit of this light. Now, this event will be periodic. This event will be very, very small because planets are very, very small. Even the largest of planets are still very, very small. But this is the kind of thing that you see in the data. Here we have the time plotted on the bottom axis and the brightness over here. So you have these uh, very symmetric regular dips that happen in time. So this is what Kepler did. It started a whole bunch of stars for a very really long time in the same spot that Oumuamua was coming from. And it not only detected thousands of planets, but it also detected this star right here, which if you did not do your homework, then you may be a little bit lost, but I can give you an overview on why this is very strange looking star, and it also has very, um, yeah, it has lots of names associated with it. Uh, but what we're looking at on the bottom axis is time, right? And the, uh, the y-axis here, this is the star's brightness. So for most of the time, the star is normal, it's flat. Uh, but then you say it punctuated at certain times with drops in its brightness. And these drops are not periodic, right? If you have a planet going in front of a star, it would occur at a predictable time interval. And you would also see the same kind of drop in the brightness, because planets don't really, the bigger the planet, the larger the drop, but you would see the same kind of drop going on and on and on. But this was not what we see for this star. Um, and long story short, stars don't do this. And this is not the only weird observations that we've seen this star do, but I'm not gonna go into that as well. Um, after a very, very, very long debate, we decided that the best explanation for what was going on is that there was a swarm of alien, meaning it's foreign, right? Zombie comets going around this star. And let me explain this for you for a minute before you start thinking that I'm a little bit out of them. So what a comet is in our own solar system is an object that comes from the very far outskirts, right? When it comes into the solar system, it's on a very egg-shaped orbit. It come, when it comes into the, the inner parts of the solar system, it starts to heat up with the sun, and it starts to outgas. And this is what makes it really big. Uh, and so, it, you know, if you're thinking of it in zombie terms, like dead zone, undead zone, this is what is causing the stuff that's happening with the star. It, it's, it's very chaotic and, and peculiar. Um, but if you're invoking something very chaotic and peculiar to explain this, and you have something extremely chaotic and peculiar, then you have to kind of invoke a whole bunch of these zombie objects to add to our model before you know we can actually model. And so, how much is is very unreasonable? And that's you know it was the um, best of very bad explanations to explain what was going on. And so the, the, the next thing, we did have another idea, um, and this came up from my colleague, Stacey Wright, and Simeon, um, and that was to look for something called a Dyson sphere. And I know what you're thinking, uh, uh, but this is not it. Um, <laughs> A Dyson sphere is something that you can imagine would be a product of some sort of mega engineering project from a civilization that's way advanced than our own. So they would they would use these kind of structures surrounded by their star for more energy or terraforming or something like that. Um, the problem with this explanation is that if you have some sort of civilization that's using all this power, right? Just like you produce a lot of heat. Just like your, your, your cell phone heats up when you're talking about it, right? Your laptop and stuff on your lap is very annoying. 
if you're going to use energy, think about that. It's going to produce heat. And so this is an infrared uh, image of somebody's house and how it is, is leaking uh, energy out of it. Um, if you have aliens that you're invoking, they would not produce heat because they're dead, right? They're the undead. All right, so that would actually work. Um, but that is not the connection that we need to take for all of this um, to be explained naturally. Um, so if you ever see the movie Zombie Land, they, they have rules. And they're very, very, very important rules of survival. And so the way we need to survive this trip, uh, trying to explain what's happening going around this star, is to follow these rules. And I'm pretty sure in here somewhere is we need to observe the shit about this star so we can figure out what's going on. Alright. Um, and so we did, and we actually caught a break. We, we found the time, the exact time when these zombies woke up, and we were able to measure it and take measurements of it and learn a lot about what was going on. And so this is this is a plot of saying, okay, we, we caught this in real time, we've got a bunch of data on it, and we're able to learn a bunch of things. Um, yay. Uh, and, uh, long story short, um, the answer is probably not aliens or zombies, or alien zombies, um, but likely it's due to some sort of magical dust. And I said magical dust just because that was the solution that we came up with, uh, but it is some kind of dust that we have never ever seen before, and it is so intriguing what it's doing, and it's, it's still got us all really stumped. And so we, we've kind of continued to doing what we're doing to study the star and try and figure out what it is. And so at the bottom here, I've listed three websites where you can follow like what's going on. Um, you can find more stars like this. The star was discovered by citizen scientists who are just looking through NASA data to try and find weird objects, right? So this is the Planet Hunters project. And this is probably one of the only stars out there with its own subreddit. Uh -huh. So that's the that's thing. And this, this Reddit page is actually pretty awesome. There's some really intelligent conversations going around there and support and discussions and things like that. So please check it out and I'm open for questions. Yes. Hey, um, <laughs> <laughs> the question was, how do 
how do you know it's not a perturbed or cloud object that got kicked? So the orc cloud in our, is, is something that's surrounded like a ball of, of objects surrounding our solar system at really great distances um, that fall in here uh, uh, randomly towards our sun at, at random orientations. Uh, huh? oh, okay. Uh, and there's a, uh, so a more a more uh, what we can do is we track its orbit and you can tell like where it's coming from and where it's going and just by using Kepler's laws, it is not a bound object to our solar system. So when it was falling, flying in from very, very far away, right? And it just kept flowing out and it will come back again. And there are objects in the orbit that you can really have the explain that it's toward its orbital injection. The question was, how close will a more more come to the Earth and when will it happen? Um, the danger of a more more coming to the Earth is, is now long gone. It, it came as close as the approach after we spotted it. So we, we spotted it uh, about a month after it's close to the approach. It's just, um, uh, it got in between Mercury and the sun's orbit of the sun. Um, and it is flying out towards the end of the solar system. Um, saving price here is this thing was very, very faint, and it was only about, you know, a mile across, kind of give or take. Um, a, a rock that killed the dinosaurs was about 10 kilometers across. And so something like this, yeah, it would, it would, it would produce, you know, it, it would make a big hole on our planet, but it would not create, you know, a mass extinction. We have, we have astronomers monitoring the sky constantly and mapping these objects, and so, we are well aware of the dangers that are out there. Yes. So if you look back along the path of Oumuamua and find some object back there, how long did it take Oumuamua to get from there to here? The question was if you look back along the path of Oumuamua's travel and uh, you calculate the time travel of a world to go from whatever object in that path, how long did it take to get here? Um, very, very, very long periods of time. I'm, I'm not actually sure if the answer is that, but I mean, interstellar spaces are very, very large. And you know, my connection to that it came from you know, this, this earlier megastructure star um, was, it, it was kind of a reach, I guess, and, and, and maybe a, not, very responsible reach in that sense, but I, I did it in the, in the spirit of astronomy on that. And so it, it's coming in those kind of distances, it's pretty far fetched. Yes. So the question was do we know where a little more came from? Uh, it, it, is, it is likely a leftover from planet formation that got affected uh, at some point. So I mean, stars form from big balls of like gas and dust, and then you know, they accumulate uh, into larger and larger particles. And uh, a lot of this stuff gets thrown out of the solar system by you know, dynamics. And so this is probably just one of those leftover pieces from another solar system that got thrown, got thrown in our direction. Last question? Yes. Was Kepler used to discover Oumuamua, or was it discovered and then Kepler used to study where it came from? So the question was, was Kepler used this, uh, to uh, study Oumuamua, or is it the other way around, uh, or to discover it? Um, uh, the Kepler Space Telescope and Oumuamua were never connected with each other in, in the sense that it's made that connection after the fact, noting that Oumuamua came from the direction that Kepler happened to be staring, which is quite a coincidence because the sky is really, really big. The Kepler Space Telescope looked at a part of the sky that contains 0.01% of the sky field that you know is available to us, and they just happen to coincide. And that's just a really, really cool point of this. And on that note, let's see if Professor Barakin.